Hello and welcome. Today our aim is to give an update on the current status regarding Sweden's ambition to become fossil free by the year 2045 and the role the forest industry plays in reaching this goal. Against this background we will also discuss the potential of German-Swedish collaborations and how these can contribute. A recorded version of this webinar will be available to you via the same link you use to connect. If any questions to our guests pop up, please send them to us at question at handelskammer.se. We will do our best to answer a couple of these at the end of the webinar Otherwise, we will get back to you later. Based on the decision by the Parliament to make Sweden climate neutral by 2045, the Fossil Free Sweden initiative has encouraged business sectors, among them the forest sector, to draw up their own roadmaps on how to become fossil free while also increasing their competitiveness. In these roadmaps, the industries describe when and how they will be fossil free, what technical solutions need to be developed, what investments need to be made, and what obstacles need to be removed. They also contain proposals regarding commitments for the stakeholders and political solutions. The Swedish Prime Minister, Stefan Löfven, has declared that Sweden's goal is to be the world's first fossil-free welfare nation. So it all fits, at least on the theoretical level. Let's see what our guests have to say about the practical side. 70% of Sweden is covered with forest. In other words, we are dealing with a raw material today that is quite hard to ignore. I believe this to be a good starting point for our discussion. How much forest can we use. I have the pleasure of hosting three distinguished guests. guests. We have Roger Josefsson, who is Head of Sustainability at Danske Bank, Henrik Brodin, Strategic Business Development Manager at the Swedish forestry company Södra, and René Backes, Business Development Specialist Renewables at BASF Nordic. A warm welcome to all of you. So enough from my side. Let's get started, uh, dive into the discussion. Um, I thought we'd start with you, uh, Roger, and maybe a bit of a macro perspective. Uh, the Swedish government's budget for climate and environment was presented just the, the other week. And uh, do you think that it meets the high ambition to become fossil free? And you also criticized the lack of new business plans. So maybe you could elaborate a bit on this. The screen is yours, Roger. Um, my name is Roger Joseph, and as, I, as you, uh, as you uh, introduced me, I'm, I'm the uh, head of sustainability at Danske Bank in Sweden. Um, I've previously been a chief economist for, for Danske Bank as well, also worked in a fintech company. Um, my views on the on the budget uh, are basically twofold. Uh, I think it's important that we all realize that we need to uh, uh, remodel the business model of Sweden, uh, which means basically that instead of uh, trying to uh, push on a string and, and utilizing only old old in, old industry, we also need to uh, explore technological uh, uh, changes and improvements and also going more and more into the service sector since these are often um, are labeled more as sustainable business models. And the other part of it is, is of course as well when you look at the, uh, at the last budget is that there's also um, some of the initiatives that was, was being mentioned uh, it could be could be confused for actually being industry policy rather than being green policy and I think that could be uh, could be an issue but I'll, uh, there are also of course uh, green spots or, or bright spots in the, in the budget, and I'll get back to them later. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Roger. Uh, interesting, and I'll hand over to you, Henrik. Uh, maybe first uh, to get back to what uh, Roger just said, do you agree that there is a lack of new business plans or business models in this budget? And uh, 
talking about the Swedish forest, uh, which is a key factor in enabling a fossil-free society, can you tell us a bit more about your project, uh, Fossil Free Södra, and also what are your greatest challenges and most important priorities currently? Because we know that there's substitution, carbon capture, but also reducing your own emissions. So it's a quite complex and diverse field and how to make the right priorities. But I'll give, hand it over to you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Helen Prudim from Sadra. Uh, I'm a said strategic business development manager. Uh, I work mainly with energy, uh, then bioenergy, of course. And I'm also responsible for our program, uh, a Fossil Free Södra, which aims to be fossil free in the production this year and uh, the transports worldwide 2030. Uh, it's a quite challenging target, uh, but we are uh, on our way. Uh, and uh, back to the, what Roy, Roy said, uh, I agree. Uh, I think we. Uh, uh, this has been a problem for Sweden for a long time, and we have addressed that problem as well uh, several times that uh, Sweden want to be become the first fossil free welfare state uh, but then the policies is more or just don't do things and uh, lower your emission uh, lower the emission in every sector and, and we're missing the uh, bigger picture like uh, the bioeconomy strategy so how does Sweden actually gain of this? There is a thought that if we go first, the world will follow. But actually, we, we, we must understand what can the world follow us on. Uh, it, it's more like, OK, we decrease our emissions as much as possible. But we have to create jobs in Sweden with what we are doing. And we have to create export potentials. So. I, I agree uh, with Roger that uh, this is a lack that we don't have this overview uh, view of actually how does Sweden gain in this uh, transformation. Uh, if we look at what we're doing uh, at Södra, we, we are working to, towards our target to become fossil free. Uh, and it goes uh, well, I would say. Uh, last year we had a 99.5 percentage uh, in our uh, production that was fossil free. So we had just yes, small streams of fossil energy going into our pulp mills, and uh, pulp mills are uh, they are consuming very very much energy. But we are uh, actually a surplus at Södra, so we produce more energy uh, than we use. So we we can also sell like district heating, electricity and uh, biofuels uh, from our mills. So uh, in that case, I think it's uh, going quite well. It's going also well uh, with transportation, at least in Sweden, where we have uh, good potentials to actually transport uh, fossil free. And here is also the challenge. Since Sweden is going so much uh, faster than the other countries, we see uh, great discrepancies when we're exporting because it's really hard to do the same thing as we do in Sweden. And one of the main challenges is to get this to the market. Uh, we know that our customers, uh, we see the end customers, they want green products, they want the transformation. But we are uh, early in the value chain and we need to push this through the complete value chain uh, and we also need to have a customer to pull in the value chain uh, and also if we to be fossil free it's uh, it's actually more expensive since you have new technologies uh, and the fossil is quite cheap or uh, right now it's very cheap uh, and we also we have to uh, split the cost through the value chain so this is a challenge uh, for us to be, become fossil free and we want to become fossil free in a way that it's beneficial for us and for our customers and for their customers as well. That's very interesting and I think uh, we'll get back to that point later uh, as well, uh, value chains and also the end consumers perspective and if the end consumers are uh, willing to pay more for green products so to say. But thank you very much uh, Henrik. And we'll move on to uh, René, uh, who represents the world's leading chemical company, BASF. So a bit of a different perspective. 
And I wanted to ask you, how do you or your company rather uh, cope with a huge transition away from fossil fuels that currently takes place? And also what impact does the Fossil Free Sweden initiative have on your company? And maybe also a bit about your, the development of your new business models or business plans, how this looks at the moment. The screen is yours, René. Yeah, thank you, Valer. Yeah, there are three points. I only have five minutes, so let's see how we can do. <laughs> no, first of all, um, how do we cope? Um, I think the most important for our industry is understand today and prepare for the future. So that means uh, know what we are, we are strong in and know where we can uh, uh, get better in the future. So as always, we are committed not only to renewable raw materials, we are first of all committed to the UN sustainability goals. That is important so that if we are changing in raw materials and greenhouse gas reduction, we are looking only on one part of that. But let's, let's face it, Sweden is especially in that part five to ten years ahead of Europe or even of the rest of the world. That's ex at least my experience here. So this is a good opportunity now to have a small country like Sweden, where you have lots of ideas, lots of potentials, what you can do and how to, let's say, enable this raw material change. And um, if I'm looking back from today and looking at the chemical industry, it's today quite linear organized. So we take out mainly crude oil or gas from fossil resources and we convert this into plastics, into, into medicaments, into everything you need, like uh, textile fibers and so on. And this is something which was grown and educated for the last 150 years. This linear thinking is now starting to be broken up, like with our initiatives in can cycling and, and biomass uh, balance projects we are launching now. And this is all connected together. Um, this is a kind of new thinking for the chemical industry right now. So that's a very interesting um, outlook for the next years. And I have a little uh, scary moment when I think about the raw material volumes we are today consuming. And if we want to change this into the future, we are facing much more than a little problem. Today, I, I always use this um, with our chem cycling activities, we have in uh, Europe access to roughly 20,000 tons, 50,000 tons of raw materials for uh, recycled plastics content for the chemical industry. And our usual demand of crude materials in, in uh, Ludwigshafen at our headquarters is roughly 2 million tons. So we are talking about a cup of uh, recycled material diluted in the Baltic Sea. This is the huge challenge we are facing. At. And I'm not talking about price of that material. You can imagine that if we are talking about 2 million tons, that small material is neglectable. Um, but secondly, you're asking about how is South Fossil Frieden uh, influencing this development? And that's, I think it's really interesting, really exciting, because this is triggering, this is initiating the first things here in the, let's say, in a very um, innovative environment in a welfare country. So this is something where you should really take a look on, take a look on the challenges. And that's basically my job here in Sweden to, to be in kind of, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm reaching out to those companies, trying to help, trying to enable those future technologies which will help um, replacing fossil raw materials. So that's, that's also one part where we are really interesting looking here. So yeah, kind of crystal ball, what will happen here in the future. And I hope we can be so fast in changing and developing as the targets set by the government and set by the European Union <laughs> as they are uh, laid out so far. This is a really strong uh, challenge for everybody here. And the first movers uh, do not have always the the best way, but let's see what will happen. Henrik or uh, Roger, do you want to comment on this or otherwise we'll move on uh, to new questions, future questions? Okay, then I'll uh, give you the word again, uh, Roger, you can of course comment on something uh, Rene said as well. Um, 
now we know that we all want to go green in a sense and the consumer uh, uh, wants it and we have to maybe do some arrangement new business plans look at the supply chains but if we take the financing part and now uh, Roger from Danske Bank I think you're uh, suitable to answer this question is there enough funding to make necessary investments that would be my first question because uh, I guess that's needed uh, to get started and uh, how do we increase the demand for sustainable products that can secure green investments and who shall pay uh, it's not only the finances someone has to pay them and can companies for example come to Danske Bank for funding uh, or let's hear your take on this for us we finance the activities that Rene and, and, and Henrik are talking about we don't make those decisions ourselves. If we look at our own uh, carbon footprint, for instance, it is extremely low. We are uh, a service company with quite a few uh, uh, properties, etc. So we don't have any direct impact, but the indirect impact is, of course, very large. But that goes via the investment and, and consumption decisions that our customers make. So we are dependent on, on BASF and Södra and other companies to make investment decisions that align with not only with, with our uh, wishes, but also with, with those of, of the society at large. So it's important to understand that we have a, a secondary role, an indirect role in affecting the climate. Um, and I, th I think that's also why it's so important for us actually to be aligned with the climate discussions. A lot of us look at us as greedy, greedy bankers, um, Fact and I mean, of course, there are some some truth to that for sure. <laughs> but I also think that we we need to remember that we we have a part of everything that goes on in the economy. Uh, we have big uh, big companies as as our clients, but we also have small consumers, and we have uh, millionaires, and we have unemployed. So the the range of customers is just immense. Uh, we also help um, governments of financing, etc., which means that. We, we make part of every activity that goes on in the economy. And since climate change is such an extremely important issue to the economy at large, it becomes naturally something that is really important for us, us too. Um, and, uh, and, and from a financial market perspective, financial perspective, we have made, I don't know, countless studies on how um, green or ESG investments uh, compared to traditional investments, and uh, and the, the the empirical research is very clear on this. Uh, it is very clear that uh, uh, the return from doing ESG investments or ESG aligned investments is actually stronger than in in in, in the general uh, in the general financial markets. We can also see that risks, long term risks, especially of course are lower uh, in companies that, that are e e has a very strong ESG focus. So from a financial market perspective, this is a, a very welcome development. We, uh, we can see that these companies that focus on ESG issues are uh, much uh, um, better, basically. They have stronger returns and, and, and lower, lower risks than other companies in the economy. So I would say that there is no lack at all of capital for for sustainable investments to the contrary and that goes not only for banks uh, but also for the other parts of the uh, of the financial industry uh, you have for instance very long-term capital coming in from pension funds etc so there's there is again there's tons of money coming in just for for the simple uh, return and and risk metrics of, of esg investments on top of that, we also have something that I also actually welcome, which I think most of you will be surprised to hear, uh, but that is actually regulations. Regulations are normally seen as some kind of uh, uh, troublemaker or something that hinders uh, uh, further development or uh, in, in innovations. But in this case, it's really, really good. We have, for instance, the EU's green taxonomy coming into the, uh, or hitting or, or uh, integrating into the financial markets right now. <clears throat> And this is really interesting because that creates a gold standard for us how to measure, how to look at uh, uh, these kinds of uh, or green investments or, or, or uh, sustainable investments. Uh, thanks to that, we can actually push ahead. Well, because if you look at a situation where we all compete with each other, even as banks or financial market participants, that means that if we are to, to push a green or a, a transition, 
then we need to uh, attach higher premiums, for instance, risk premiums on some things or and lower on others. But that's very difficult to do uh, for one individual player. What needs to be done is basically that the regulators come to us and say, hey, we want you to do this because in a couple of years we will actually use that regulations to make you uh, 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 charge a higher premium for, for risky investments or, or brown or investments or whatever you want to call them. Uh, so what's happening now is that the financial industry is actually pushing ahead, saying that we have to do that transition now because in a couple of years this will be become law or become regulations. And no one wants to be left uh, left sitting with all the, the bad assets or the bad companies in their portfolio. So this is actually a good development as well. So capital is not an issue and we are also getting um, uh, strengthened or this, this process is also underlined by, by regulatory developments. Thank you very much. I'll let you comment, uh, René and Henrik. Uh, we can start with you, Henrik. I just wanted to use my mandate as a moderator uh, to uh, ask you, Roger, as being head of sustainability at a big bank, for how long, I'm just curious, have banks had this kind of position? How new is it to have someone responsible for sustainability? Just very short. Um. Uh, well, uh, to, to be honest, and this is one thing that I've, since I'm, I'm coming in from, from another position in, in the bank, uh, I, think that I'm, I'm, I think I need to be completely clear about this. I think that, that sustainability, in not just in banks, but in a lot of companies, has been seen as some kind of PR tool. Uh, and I think that it has been used to basically to relay and discuss uh, with uh, authorities, uh, governments, etc. Uh, but for I would say that for at least now five to ten years, if you look at the at least the Nordic banks, I would say that this has trans transformed into something else. And with the advent, I would say of of more reliable data, and also of the fact that we are now integrating that data into decision models for economic policy, I would say that it's it's rapidly uh, coming in from. Uh, the outskirts of the organizational structure coming into the center of, of the bank's organization. And I, I think I am a, a good symbol of that coming from uh, a previous position as a chief economist. Thank you very much. Very interesting. And uh, now uh, the screen is yours, uh, Henrik, for comments, and I promise I will not uh, interrupt this time. So please, Henrik. Uh, no, but I agree uh, what uh, what Roy is saying that uh, we don't see the lack of a capital uh, in that case. Uh, it's more a question of risk uh, to go first and to be innovative uh, for sure is uh, to taking risk uh, and uh, that risk is also always a problem for banks and for companies. Uh, so I would say it's not a question. Of getting capital, it's a question of getting the right portfolio with risk and uh, with the right portfolio with your old uh, traditional products and the, the products that's actually uh, gain money into the company and to uh, to grow with the right uh, portion of risk. Uh, and all, it's also, of course, always a risk to sitting sitting in old uh, business models. Uh, it's just not the new businesses are, that are a risk. Every business is always a risk. Uh, so, so I will say it's more of, of this transition is more a question of risk than a question of capital. Thank you. Um, René, some comments from you? Yeah. First, first of all, one important comment is that what I see is it's not driving by, by driven by regulations. What I feel personally feel is it's more intrinsically driven by society, by customers, and by by companies itself. So I think in this time, especially speaking for Sweden and the Nordic region, the regulations at the at the politic politician side is not directing it's more following the spirit which is in the society so that's from from my side and now we have to face it with a typical i would say more conservative thinking of the industries of the banks and what's happening now and and that that leads me to the situation that i say we have to open up 
for new ideas, for new concepts, for new business models. And we always tend after the first two steps to compare this with the existing market, with the existing products, with the existing business uh, models. And unfortunately, this could kill, and now I'm speaking as new business development manager, this could kill basically good ideas in the beginning because we are too early comparing with established models. And that's also connected to you, Henrik, this is also connected to risk. So yes, we are very carefully today, we are in our comfort zone. And if we really want to change, we have to exit this comfort zone. Yeah, so, but yeah, this is even, even if it is said so easily, it is so difficult to put this into reality, I know. Thank you. Let us then uh, get back to uh, the theme of today. Uh, everything we talk about is interesting, at least in my point of view, but uh, let's talk a bit more about uh, the forest. Uh, and that means going back to you, Henrik, with the comments from the other two of you, of course. But simple question, will the Swedish forest provide enough to meet the global demand? I'm thinking now about the forest. And second question, uh, since we are talking a lot about new business models, cooperations, uh, German-Swedish collaborations, if Roger, this is hypothetical, of course, I don't have a new business plan, uh, but if Roger would say there is green, uh, there is funding for a green innovative investment within Södra, and maybe even René BASF is interested in some way, what would you present? You have perfect freedom here. It's all hypothetical, as I said. Please. I look forward to it as well, I might say. <laughs> Uh, the, easy, the simple answer or your simple question is no. Uh, there is, of course, not enough forest uh, in Sweden for everything. Uh, we have to be responsible with the use, uh, usage of forest. We have to be responsible with the usage of all resources. Uh, but if we take this uh, question one step further, uh, we can do a lot from the forest. We can do a lot more than we do today, and especially we can have forest as a source in all of the world and then the forest can provide very much uh, it's naive to think that what a, re uh, a resource from one country in the world can solve all the world problems uh, and i think this is something we have to go into we have been uh, spoiled with the oil i would say we have had one really really good product that can do so much great uh, and it's come from a few sources, but now we have to find, every country have to find their uh, core competence, and you have to see what can we do in our country, uh, and how can we use our natural resources at the best, and how can we create uh, jobs and welfare in our country, but also how can we export what we ha are having to other countries. So the Swedish forest can help both in Sweden and it can help uh, in other countries. And we are today uh, an exporting country, uh, an exporting company. So I would say the forest uh, will last, uh, will, will do great products. And what we see in Sweden, I think we shall aim for uh, taking our forest as far as possible in the value chain because we have great, uh, we are a very innovative co country uh, and we shall produce products. We shall not just export the forest as a forest, uh, but we shall export it as products uh, and, and we shall have it in a bioeconomy uh, way. So the forest will not save all the world's problem, but it's a, uh, if we do it in the right way, we can get buildings, we can get uh, pa paper, uh, packaging, textiles, uh, fuels, chemicals from the same tree. So we have to do it in the right way. If we look on the other question, uh, what Roger shall invest in, uh, then I will say uh, it's, it's a joint venture we have in Norway with uh, Stuffcraft, uh, Silva Green Fuel. So what we are doing there, we're right now building a demo plant. Uh, and we take solid biomass and turn it into a bio crude, which means that we can take the lowest possible uh, residues from the forest, things that's not used today uh, for products. For example, we can take bark, the tops, branches, 
uh, and tra transform it into a bio crude that actually can replace a crude oil. So with this, we today aim for the transport sector, since transport sector uh, paying best due to regulations. But of course, we can take it to everything that use oil today can use this bio oil, and it's easy to transport all over the world. So by uh, so. Uh, branches and tops is not easy to transport, but now we condensate them to be able to transport. So this is, uh, I would say, uh, a great potential for countries like Sweden to take our uh, resource and to be able to export it all over the world to solve uh, the old problems with the new products, with the old process. Thank you. Um, I'll let you comment. Let's start with you, uh, René, and then Roger. I just wanted to say that what a powerful raw material when you mentioned the wood and everything that we can do. That was impressive. Please, René. Yeah, first of all, totally agree. It makes sense to use every raw material as efficiently as possible. And then we are looking into more into the re re direction of sustainability. Um, I would say if we start to exploit the forest, as you propose, Henrik, and the residues of the forest, we have to keep a very close eye on the sustainability facts here, especially in, in the Swedish region. We know that we can do it. But if I look all around the world, it's very easy to exploit the forest, let's say, unsustainable. And that's why I think the Swedish region, the Nordic region, Norway, you mentioned Norway, is one of those exemplary regions where you can install such a thing. And if this is positive in economics, then you could roll this out all over Europe. From that point, it's a wonderful idea. On the other hand, I must say as a critical, yeah, you have to give, you are taking a lot of material out of the forest yeah, and you have to give, let's say the essentials back to the forest somehow. And that's, that's from the other point of view, it's not easy to just take everything which uh, it seems to be so easy to, to get it out of the forest. And that's what, what I think is, is it's nice set, but it's not, let's say, proven that it is 100% working. Um, so the demand, I agree, cannot be uh, the demand of raw materials, for example, like fuels, cannot be solved from the forest production in Sweden. But this could also use as a as a template for a worldwide uh, rollout. And then I would really love that Sweden is, with its innovative culture, is one of the leading companies who is developing those technologies, which is then fitting for other places around the world. Thank you, uh, Roger. Short comment from your side. Do you agree? Uh, <laughs> no, not at all, actually. <laughs> There is definitely, uh, and now I'm speak, I must admit, I must underline that I'm speaking as an economist now, but uh, th there is definitely sufficient uh, amount of forest for all of us. It's a simple uh, market mechanism, supply and demand. So if there is a su sufficient uh, demand for the forest, then prices will rise so much that uh, other other things will not, uh, probably not, uh, it's, it won't be valuable enough to make, uh, I don't know, paper or whatever you want to, want to make from it. So, so from that, from that, from that aspect, I, I think there is definitely a sufficient amount of forest. But, but Rene, I think you was who, who lifted the question, which I think is really interesting as well, and that is, uh, if we uh, win, or uh, that was Henrik, by the way, we what we need to do is increase value added, increase the productivity of the of the raw material. And what we are alluding to here, and that's why I say that, that I, there's there is probably enough. There will be a competition for this scarce resource. Uh, and it will go to where you have the highest return. And and from what uh, from what I gather from what you said so far, I, I would assume that, for instance, uh, biofuels is one very interesting area where there is probably very high value added in this our sector. And this is also why I think that Sweden is can be a role model in the sense that uh, um, crude oil is probably still cheaper as a raw material, but with with uh, with quite small. Uh, changes to to uh, to the, uh, from the regulator, uh, the government, then we can actually make uh, forest raw material more competitive. And I think that 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 is a, a really interesting um, uh, avenue to explore. But I'm I'm, I'm guessing that both Rene and uh, Henrik are going to 
try to to put me down now. So shoot. <laughs> Do you want to comment, uh, René or Henrik? Otherwise, get, get, please <laughs> give me give me one second. That's exactly as you said. Um, there is enough raw material available if you just make it in a fair competition on price. And yes, you have to know that if you want to convert forest into fuels, you are losing basically half of the material in forms of CO2 and water just to get the energy concentration of wood to a level which is equivalent for fuel. And then this, that is really getting tricky because the oil is for chemists, I'm sorry to say, it's highly attractive it's full of energy and it's it's no water in it so that's that's my my dream material and i was trained for the last 20 years to use oil as a chemist and we have to break this we have to break this thinking saying how can we manage the energy content of materials how can we manage to convert forest materials into new products and then i'm i'm really interested in asking a provocative question are you really telling me to plant wood and to convert it into fuel and burn it directly thereafter. And I'm sorry, this is something I have a, I have a split mind. I don't know, yeah, that this would, the future will show. Uh, I have to comment, uh, I, I, we, I, I don't think we should plant wood for use it as, as energy. Uh, <laughs> even though if you look back uh, at, at all the time, would have been used as fuel for as long as people has uh, have the fire the possibility to, <laughs> to do the fire but of course it's just as I said before the tree shall be used in uh, as it fits best I think the stem wood must go to buildings and in that case we shall replace uh, concrete and steel which in their case don't need that much energy uh, if we don't pr produce so much concrete and steel. So we have to find market mechanism where we actually uh, do as much, much as possible from every part of the tree. Uh, and I don't, we will never plant trees to make fuel. Uh, we will plant trees to build houses and we will use what we can use for the materials. And then the fuel is still the less uh, last step, when we hear, we shall create as much value as possible uh, for that step. And of course, if you as a chemistry can make uh, good things out of the uh, wood instead of burning it as a fuel, yeah, but then you can pay better and then you will get the material. We will sell it to you if you pay best. It's very interesting. I thought uh, the digital format uh, it's sometimes uh, difficult to have a real debate or discussion, but I was proven wrong. It's perfectly possible to, uh, so thank you for this. And um, I think we have to move on. We could discuss this for another hour probably, at least, but uh, maybe there's time in the future to do exactly that. But let's move on to uh, one field also in our uh, webinar today, which uh, is uh, the question of German-Swedish collaborations. And I'll let you start here, uh, René, I just, uh, and the other two of you, I uh, look forward to your comments. Uh, we've talked a lot about business models, maybe the lack of business models or the need for new business models, and that companies, uh, I read between the lines, uh, tend to be narrow-minded. Uh, maybe, and not always too all that open to new cooperations that could be possible. So, uh, simple question, uh, how can Germany and Sweden collaborate more and better? Big question, of course, but I look forward to your input and a lively debate. So, uh, René, you can start this time and let's see what the other two say. Well, Thank you very much. This is exactly entering my personal topic where I where, where my job is located for here in Sweden directly. I have only two eyes and two ears and my job is can we move the chemical industry in forms of BSF? Can we move it to the next level regarding projects, materials, raw materials, product, whatever? Can we move this forward? And I would say Sweden is a perfect example for a cooperation regarding a more sustainable use of raw materials, like materials together with the forest industry, like now I'm, I'm all 
a little stretching this out, it's, it's also possible for us to look in a recycling business to become more and more circular. And what I can, what I can uh, offer from BSF side is we are not the most fastest and flexible company in the world, but we have totally different business models. We have totally different supporting models, technical models, how we can support young companies, fresh ideas, and uh, very, let's say, inspiring technologies, looking into and helping them to maturize, to get to a level that we can talk about commercial production in the next 10 years. So this is what I can offer. But as always, it is a matter of good ideas, of right timing, of the right people. And that, I think, is the, the critical part to bring those together. And that's why the collaboration between Sweden and Germany is so important. That's why we have to foster this and strengthen this a little bit more. How can we get closer together? How can we enable discussion places where we can, on the one hand, leave freedom to everybody and on the other hand, get the right support at the right timing to the right people? And that's, that's I think that's the real challenge. The ideas are there, the money is there. We heard from, from Danske Bank yeah, the demand is there. How can we make this happen and to get a, a new perspective and not, let's say, look on it, say, ah, not now, maybe in next five years, then come back, then it is too late. So if we want really to change into a fossil free future, especially Sweden is, is straight ahead. If we want to change, we have to do it now, we have to stick our heads together. So that's yeah, I have only two eyes, two ears. I'm really happy that I can talk to you, Henrik, and, and uh, <laughs> Oga, that maybe if you think about another two eyes and ears who could, let's say, collaborate here on that topic, let's do this. From BSF side, what I can offer is, from us, you will get uh, fundamental feedback in regards of carbon footprint, in regards of sustainability evaluation. We have our targets in reducing our carbon footprint, or at least keeping it stable for the next 10 years and then reduce it. And we have programs in within BSF like carbon management program. And um, we are also looking into our waste. How can we take our waste back into new raw materials with our initiatives, for example, with the uh, um, uh, Alliance to End Plastic Waste. And this is everything we could put on the table. And maybe it makes sense to combine recycling of materials and bio-based raw materials and convert this back into new value-added products. I think that's that's what we can offer. Um, yeah. First, so so far, so on. Well, that's a quite uh, positive note, note here, uh, which I'm uh, glad for. You also mentioned or picked up uh, Rene, the question of urgency, as you mentioned, Roger, early on as well. We don't have that much time. It has to happen now. And that's quite easy to say. And then time passes and you're still saying it's uh, urgent. But I think that's uh, clear for, uh, for me and also for our viewers today. Uh, so a couple of comments. You can start, Henrik. No, I, I, I agree. Uh, we have to be open-minded and uh, try to, from all everybody, all parts, to see how can we cooperate together and what uh, if we start to cooperate, which competences we need and where, where how can we grow together and be stronger? Uh, and do we need other parties in uh, line as well? Uh, I think. Uh, it is most important is to start to work in new value chains and to understand that this transformation is not being made by a single company. Uh, it's being made where we go away from this linear thinking uh, and to a circle of thinking, both of in business models and in uh, products. So it's, of course, uh, one way of also to combine uh, biomethanol material with uh, recycled material uh, and to find new ways of actually find new value chains. But the most important is to work uh, uh, open-minded in new value chains and find, always see the uh, possibilities. Thank you, Roger. You can start right away. Uh, all right. Uh, well, uh, it will be quite 
quite short actually. I've, there's a couple of things that I'm, I'm thinking of. I, I'm just fresh out of another meeting, and I think that what we can do from a banking financial market perspective, speaking of funding and, and finding the, the risk willingness, I think it's also important that we receive the information. Uh, I think it's, uh, I, I really love to hear the passion that both Rene and Henrik is speaking of with, with uh, about, uh, regarding, for instance, forest or and what how it differs from from uh, from, from oil as a, as a raw material. And that kind of information is really important for us because we will never be experts on your company or on your products. That's that's what you do. But what you can help us with is giving us the relevant information. Uh, and just to give you an idea, of, and that's for, from my previous meeting, is that we've, we've actually examined the, 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 the CSR or ESD reports from 100 companies. And when we looked at the data points, we can see that it's about 70, uh, 70 or 72 percent of all the data points regarding EST that is actually not informative because it says not, it's very generic. It just talks about um, uh, the, the carbon dioxide emissions per employee, for instance. But what we need with the information that we need to help you is how does it affect you? Is how is this material for your company? It's material for the environment, yes, but it must also be material for, for your company so that we can estimate these risks. And the other thing is, and I, I, uh, I tried to bring it up before, and that is one thing that I think Sweden is, is actually doing uh, very well is, well, there's a general interest of the environment and, and to fight climate change, but I also think that we should actually think of it from a regulatory perspective, because a lot of these transitions that you talk about, a lot of the the possibilities or the in incentives to take on risks will actually come from uh, from regulators, and we uh, and I think that is something that we also need to to uh, put on the table here. Uh, speaking of, uh, for instance, mixing HVO uh, fuels into the normal diesel, etc. So I think that's we also need to have that regulatory perspective on it. I think they are also on a neighbor here. Thank you. Underbart um, är kort, as we say in Swedish. Uh, wonderful is short or goes uh, quickly. We uh, have about uh, 10 minutes left uh, on this uh, of this uh, session, uh, so it's time to start to wrap it up a bit. Uh, and general uh, outlook, or if we go even more into the hypothetical field, if you this question goes to all three of you. And I want an answer for from all three of you, of course. If you were, let's say, Minister of uh, Finance, what or how would you spend the money? That's the first question. I have a couple of more, but if you were Finance Minister, how would you spend the money? And who wants to start? I'll give it to you, Roger. <laughs> that's the finance that's, guy. <laughs> yeah, that's what I what I was afraid of. Uh, well, uh, I think when one thing that I mean we we talked about the budget before, and I think one thing that is really important is that it does not just become posturing, uh, and I think that becomes more and more important. Uh, for instance, I mean if you look at uh, the the biggest uh, em emission emissions in Sweden, they are actually quite concentrated. Uh, so uh, you could, at a relatively low cost, actually uh, uh, be eliminate a large part of the, the CO2 emissions in Sweden. And I think it's, I mean, we have that plastic, uh, plastic bag tax, for instance, that I don't think anyone is actually approving of. It's more, that's co completely just posture politics instead of real politics. Politics do really matter. So I think it's extremely important that you do stuff that matters for the environment, and that does is not industry politics, and it's not just posturing. Uh, and I, that's that's my um, uh, my input. But I'm, I'm glad to hear from the other my fellow finance ministers, Rene and Henrik, as well, what what they plan to do. Yeah, that was a quite a clear vision, I would say. So now it's up to you to deliver, Henrik. Yeah, uh, and I will uh, place my money where I think Sweden is lacking. We are really good on uh, lowering our, our emissions and we are really good on uh, research and development, but we are lacking in scaling up. So I will place the money to scale up innovation, uh, to 
take a risk, share the risk between the uh, enterprises and the state to go from really good reaches and development to go to actually first of a, of a kind plans. To, and I will definitely see what, what is Sweden's core competence, where shall we go? Uh, and then I'm, you not, must understand what's, what's the surface in Sweden uh, covered by. So I will place it on the forest, in the forest of course, and to scale up uh, innovations from forest to create jobs and welfare all over the country, because uh, then we will need jobs for, for, at, at banks, we will need uh, business developers as, as, <laughs> us here, but we will also need people working in the forest, we will need people working at the, at the plants. Uh, so we create jobs in many different le levels. Uh, so I will change the policy we have right now to going from lower our emissions as much as possible to actually create jobs and innovations. Uh, and it will stick together to maximize uh, the use of the, the raw materials. Interesting and quite yeah. nice to be the finance minister of Sweden. And maybe especially if you're a German, sort of surprising, uh, but also definitely thrilling. Uh, René, please. Well, well, uh, as uh, uh, Roger and Henrik said before, I think money we have, it's not to place money uh, on special topics. But I totally speak now as a new business development uh, fellow. So this is what, what would help me the most would be creating the bridge between um, more expensive raw materials and bigger demand in the market. So supporting Henrik with, uh, let's say, with bridging volume growth. And on the other side, I would try, but don't, don't cite me too often, but I would try to support, um, let's say, climate conscious consumer choices. As Sweden's uh, government was stating in the beginning of 2019, Let's say support the consumers by uh, making a climate friendly choice. And this is, uh, let's say, uh, turning the wheel a little bit faster that the demand is growing. And I would say it's like, like typical finance ministers from Germany, the market can regulate it. And if something goes wrong, we should punish those who, who act wrong. So th this is what more and more, let's say, a gentle touching of the finance situation here. Thank you. Uh, many insights in uh, quite a short amount of time, <laughs> I would say, and great, great plans ahead. Um, before we say goodbye, I wanted to say a couple of words uh, on the German Swedish Chamber of Commerce, where I am today in our studio. Uh, since we're always, not only today, the four of us looking ahead into the bright future, I just wanted to mention two upcoming webinars. On November 4th, we talk German-Swedish business opportunities regarding hydrogen, also an important topic for the future in Sweden and Germany. And on November 12th, we arrange a webinar on circular economy with uh, Ibrahim Bailan, Minister for Business, Industry and Innovation. So there we have the possibility to see what the political side is doing. And uh, please look out for the German-Swedish Tech Forum, which is the umbrella for uh, these uh, webinars. And we very much look forward to seeing you all again, either as speakers or viewers, listeners. And uh, thank you very much to all of you and maybe as a last before we say goodbye today I wanted to thank you but also very short one minute each key insights from today's session I took some notes and uh, my notes say more collaboration look into value chains new business models but you are the experts so have you learned anything from today's session and if you haven't learn anything, maybe want to share some insights, what's important for the future. And thank you again. And Roger, you can start and then we take René and Henrik. Uh, no, I, I have my, my, the insights from today, I think, is, 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 is manifold. But my, what I take with me is basically the discussion that we've had here 
on the very um, uh, many good ideas that, that that we can actually bring about to uh, to improve the the, the use of, of forest, for instance, uh, and uh, the the optimism that is actually emanating from the business sector in general, from both BASF and Sergio, uh, which I think is very rewarding because. Uh, as I said, we're, a bank can never be a specialist on on, uh, on technology or even on a company, but we can we can help you finance it. So we, it seems like we both have the ideas uh, and the money. So I, I guess it's it's uh, time to start uh, to start uh, doing shop. Renier, please yeah, last same, word same for today. Same from, same from my side. I really like to be confirmed in this inspiring discussions that there is a, a broad movement where, among industry uh, sectors like finance and uh, especially on the raw material side, Henrik. So that's what makes me very confident that we are on track here and we do not lose time. And that's, this, that's, that's more important for me as well. Thank you. And it's always a pleasure to have the very last words, Henrik. So please. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but the sad thing I have the last last word is that I don't don't say anything opposite what <laughs> they have said. So I agree on the other side. Uh, it's the most important is to get things done, uh, and we see that the, the bank sector are uh, willing to participate, uh, and we see from different parts of the industry that everyone wants to move in the same direction, and we see actually from both EU and uh, different governments that they also want in this direction. And of course, many people want to walk uh, in this direction as well. And we have to do it. So what's uh, up now for us is to start uh, continue to collaborate and uh, let's do business of uh, all these good things that are out there. Thank you very much. One last comment from my side. Uh, it's always easy as a moderator because I can choose, but I have to do a correction. Uh, our uh, webinar on hydrogen is on the 6th of November and nothing else. <laughs> so now we all know that. Uh, it's 11.59. Uh, I think it's fair to close this discussion. And a big thank you to you. And I mentioned at the beginning, you can send us questions and we'll uh, let these questions go to our participants of today. So thank you and hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.